So let, let, let's take a look. Um, first of all, of course, when you want to discuss the possibilities of the court to, um, to take a look at restrictive measures and sanctions, um, the very first thing that we always do, and it's also what I, what I tell my students is go back to the competence. Um, so allow me to, to briefly revisit it with, with you. I'm, I'm sure you have been discussing this perhaps yesterday as well, uh, but there's a few legal bases and some of them are a bit different and it will be a nice to have a discussion also perhaps later on um, on the differences between these, uh, between these legal bases. So first of all, of course, there's Article 215. Um, I think one of the most important ones in, in, in the whole story that we're discussing at the moment. As you can see, uh, Article 15 allows for the, um, for the, uh, for the council to adopt decisions. And it's interesting to see, uh, and I'm sure you have discussed that as well, but let me, let me underline that again, that we have this sort of two-step procedure um, here, right? So where a decision, uh, adopted in accordance with chapter two of title five, that is the, the CFSP chapter. So where a CFSP decision provides for the interruption or reduction um, of economic and financial relations with one or more countries, the council um, acting by a qualified majority uh, on a joint proposal by the high representative and the union, uh, sorry, high representative and the commission shall adopt the necessary measures. So uh, how does this work? Um, just. To, to, to lay it out very clearly for you, you have indeed a CFSP decision, and in that CFSP decision, uh, mention is being made of the need for an interruption or reduction of uh, economic and financial relations um, with other countries. So interesting um, to, to, to note that the article says that the council shall adopt, right? So there's an obligation for the council actually um, to do that shall adopt the necessary measures um, it shall inform the, the European Parliament, but there's this obligation to do that. Um, and this is the very first part. Huh? So this is about um, one or more third countries. You see that if you, if you go continue reading this, this article, you see that it's also possible to have restrictive measures against natural and legal persons. And that is, of course, also something that we've been discussing um, this morning um, as well. Um, the other thing, I'm not sure that you have been discussed uh, to some extent, uh, is Article 75. And if there's time during the uh, discussions, I would, would really um, pick this up. Um, also, because one of the things I'm wondering about, uh, being an academic, being far from practice, um, is the difference between the two. Um, when the Lisbon Treaty came out, um, and we had both Article 215 and Article 75, uh, many of my many of my colleagues started writing about well, this is this is actually quite strange uh, because it's not absolutely clear what the difference between the two um, legal bases is. If you look at Article 75, it's very much related to the area of freedom, security, and justice. Uh, so, where necessary to achieve the objectives set out in the area of freedom, security, and justice, as regards preventing and combating terrorism and related activities, uh, the European Parliament and the Council. Um, shall take uh, measures. So this is very much uh, about the AFSJ, very much about the area, um, and very much about preventing and combating terrorism. Um, and as you can see also, the, the procedure is completely different, right? So we have, we're dealing with the ordinary legislative procedure, so the, the normal procedure, you could say, um, in EU law with a commission proposal, with a um, decision in the end being taken by the Council and the Parliament. So in this sense, this is the, what you would normally expect. And the other one, T215, is much more the one that is based on CFSP. So given these two different legal bases, obviously the question is how do you make a choice between the two? Um, if you look at the literature, um, many people would say in the beginning, um, let's say 10 years ago, um, that if it had to do with combating terrorism, so counter-terrorism measures, then Article 75 was the only possible legal basis. But in practice, that's not the case. I mean, we have seen many, many hybrid things, uh, and it's it's far from clear um, in which case the council actually opts for Article 215 or Article 75. Although, in my experience, if you look at what comes out in terms of, of decisions on sanctions, most of them are actually uh, based on Article uh, 215 on the basis of a previous 
um, see if a speed is issue. In the early days, um, of course, this was a was a question of, of controversy as well because the, the parliament parliaments immediately started proceedings in what was it 13010 case 13010, in which parliament actually said, while the council had adopted uh, sanctions on the basis of 215, this should actually have been done on the basis of Article 75. Why? Obviously, because this provision provides Parliament with many more uh, competences and influence on the actual decision. So this is actually the one that is that is the favourite of, of, of Parliament. So anything related to terrorism uh, should, according to the Parliament, be based on this. Um, so let's take an, another look at how this um, how this Article 75 relates to, um, to 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 sanctions. So the Article 75 sanctions are directed only, and that's important to to realize as well, to natural and legal persons, to groups or non-state entity, entities, but not to states. Uh, and Article 15 we have seen can both be used for individual sanctions and for sanctions against states. So. It is being said that the provision therefore is the correct legal basis for financial and administrative sanctions um, that are uh, directed against potential terrorists. Um, but again, as I said, um, something for the discussion, to what extent is that actually uh, being consistently uh, used in, in, in practice? Um, 215 is used in CFSP situations. So then the question is, are terrorism questions not CFSP issues, and that is, of course, a, exactly where um, where the problem arises. Uh, in many cases, um, there is some, there may be some terrorism elements, um, also in the case of, of CFSP, uh, obviously, I would even say so. Um, and that, of course, makes it makes it very difficult. So as I said, this, this Article 215 procedure is interesting because it has this two-step procedure, right? So it first starts with this CFSP decision in the council, um, and then that is followed uh, by uh, a regulation um, on the basis of Article 215. The two are necessarily connected, and I'll come back to that when we discuss one of the cases later on. Um, so we have this first CFSP decision on the basis of Article 29, um, then followed by a regulation uh, on the basis of Article 215. By the way, most of the time, adopted uh, at exactly the same time because they're very much connected throughout the entire uh, procedure. Um, Article 29, by the way, is interesting because um, it's now used as the more or less basis for only uh, re re restrictive measures. Um, that is quite strange because if you actually look at Article 29, it's, it's actually a very general legal basis for the council to, see, to base all kinds of CFSP uh, decisions on. Um, in practice, it is now being used as the sanctions uh, legal basis for, for CFSP. Uh, again, something that is interesting because it has developed into practice. Uh, it's not necessary from a legal uh, perspective per se. Um, I have to switch off my Siri here. It's also always interfering at the, the wrong moments. Um, let's, let's take a look at, um, at the court's uh, role uh, in that. Um, interesting enough, and, and I'll also take some time because then I don't have to overlap with, with many of the other things that have to have been said this morning. I'll take some time to discuss a bit with you the jurors in CVSP um, as such. Um, Article 21, sorry, 24, 1, um, you can see it here, um, is essential. Uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union shall not have jurisdiction with respect to these CVSP provisions. That is a very clear line, right? Um, and, and I think Julia this morning already referred to that as well. Actually, this is very clear. The Court of Justice shall not have jurisdiction with respect to CFSP provisions. There are only two sort of um, exceptions. Um, and that is Article 40. Um, Article 40, which has to do with the correct uh, choice for the legal basis. So if you have a, a dispute on a, on a legal basis question between a CFSP legal basis and a legal basis somewhere else in the treaty, um, then the court can actually, on the basis of Article 40, um, say something on the on the correct legal basis. Um, the other exception to the um, to the um, ruling out of the court's jurisdiction, if you want, um, would be second paragraph of Article 275, which is indeed, and we'll come to that, um, uh, restrictive measures. measures. 
uh, imposed on individuals. So this is what is normally called the, the um, carving out um, of, of the court's jurisdiction from the treaty with, again, using the terms that the court has used, clawing back in two cases, uh, and that is Article 40 and Article 275. So we'll, we'll probably come back to that um, if we have some time, but this is interesting, right? So in general, the, the feeling could be on the basis of this 20, Article 20, 24, that there is no role for the court uh, apart from in these two situations. And what we've seen happening over the past, let's say, 10 years or so, is completely the opposite. Um, the, the court has really, really taken its role uh, serious under CVSB um, and has become also uh, the court in, in, all those, in all those situations, irrespective of the fact um, that Article 24 tells us that it has no role in that. Similar thing in, in, um, in Article 275. Sorry, I, that is what I meant to say before as well. The Court of Justice of the European Union shall not have jurisdiction with respect to the provisions relating to the common foreign security policy. So on two separate occasions in the treaty, one in the TEU, one in the, in the TFEU, um, the member states at the time laid down that really put in writing, um, actually, that the court should not have jurisdiction in CFSP apart from very two very specific situations. <clears throat> um, I already mentioned this um, this exception. Let's let's zoom in a bit on um, on specifically what we're talking about, leaving Article Forty uh, aside and focusing then on Article Article Two Seventy Five's uh, second uh, part, which refers to Article Two Sixty Three, allowing the court to uh, reviewing the legality of decisions providing for restrictive measures against natural or legal persons. So. This is the reason, this possibility is the reason why we have so many sanctions cases. This is the competence of the court, uh, the jurisdiction of the court to say something about the legality of all those measures and allowing individuals to use Article 263 to actually um, challenge those uh, decisions. So just re refresh your memory. What are we talking about again? If we're talking about 263 paragraph four, uh, for those of you who are not reading the uh, European uh, treaties uh, on a daily basis, uh, this again is what it is. Uh, any natural or legal person may, under the conditions laid down in, in the, the rest of the uh, of the article, institute proceedings against an act addressed to that person, or which is of direct and individual concern to them. So this allows individuals, natural persons, legal persons, uh, under certain conditions, um, to indeed challenge uh, decisions that have affected them. Uh, this is the general, um, the general judicial protection that is offered to anyone uh, in the European Union. And through Article 75, um, the treaty now also allows um, this article to be used in the case of sanctions. So this is just to, to, to give you the basis of what we're, uh, what we're talking about. So... What then about <coughs> the court's jurisdiction in CFSP? As we have seen, both Article 24, Paragraph 1, and Article 275 seem to, prima facie, exclude the court's jurisdiction in CFSP. Yet, at the same time, already quite soon after the, um, the Lisbon Treaty entered into force, we had this Mauritius case. Uh, you may have discussed this one as well. If, if, if not, take a very good look at what the court said here. Uh, the final sentence of the second paragraph of Article 24 and the first paragraph of Article 275 introduce a derogation from the rule of the general jurisdiction which Article 19 TU confers on the court to ensure that in the interpretation and application of the treaties, the law is observed. And they must, therefore, be interpreted narrowly. This means that basically what the court says here is that what is important is the role of the courts in general on the basis of Article 19 to provide judicial protection to everyone. The exceptions in relation to CFSP should be interpreted narrowly. 
this case was important at the time. Um, many, many people wrote on this one and say, okay, this is this is going to be big. Uh, we're not really sure what it's what it's what it means that those exceptions are going to be interpreted narrowly, and that we should start from the idea that the court has overall jurisdiction on the basis of Article 19, but it's going to be big. Um, and those people were right, actually, um, because it has become um, perhaps even the starting point, although there were some earlier indications also, uh, I may come back to later, um, but giving an indication that the court's jurisdiction in CFSP um, is much broader than you could think, could have thought on the basis of Article 24 and Article 275. Just to give you some examples of that, um, um, there's one case, um, the H case, which has become quite famous and which uh, recently came to uh, at least uh, an end um, for now, um, after after 10 years or so. And the H case was, um, it's not about sanctions, but let me just um, give you give you some idea because it explains how this jurisdiction of the court works. Each case was about staff matters. It was about a staff conflict between somebody who worked for an EU military mission um, and the EU and the EU military mission. Um, H she wanted to, she was transferred and she was not in, she was not in agreement of the decision on her transfer, so she wanted to challenge that decision. Um, the question, of course, was, um, this is a military mission, right? So this is CFSP. Should Article 24 uh, not apply? Would this not um, be a, a typical situation where the court would say, uh, listen, this is a clear CFSP uh, decision. Uh, I'm not able to, to say anything about this for the simple reason that, it's, uh, that it is excluded uh, by the treaty. That is not what the court did. Um, so that is why many of us were eagerly waiting for H at, at the time uh, and for all the follow-ups that, that, that came after. Um, the court actually said, um, well, yes, this is in the context of CFSB. Absolutely clear, right? This is a military operation and this is a person who's working there. So the context is clearly CFSB. Um, that does not mean that I, the court, cannot say anything on, on staff matters. That's a totally different thing. So I reserve the right, and I think I have the right, I even have the obligation on the basis of Article 19, um, to accept this and to accept jurisdiction um, and to rule in a situation like this. We've seen many more of these cases over the past few years. Satsan is, is another example, more recent one, where you have these staff matters, staff problems um, that are accepted by the court, even if it is a, about a very clear uh, CFSP um, situation. The other one I mentioned here is uh, Ila Italiana, uh, which was about um, uh, the question of who could actually uh, provide helicopters to an EU military mission. Um, so it was a public procurement uh, situation. Again, the same question was uh, arose, and, and the council, of course, claimed that, listen, it is a clear CFSP situation. Um, there's no role for the court here. Take a look at the treaty. Uh, at the same time, the court said, um, I see it differently. Again, I see this as, um, I agree that this is a CFSP context, but at the same time, I see that it is about public procurement. It's about other fundamental principles in EU law, and I, the court, do have a task here to, to say something about that. So a, a number of these cases uh, indeed showed that uh, what was already said in Mauritius, um, that the court's jurisdiction under CFSP um, is much broader than you could have thought on, on the basis of perhaps um, a more superficial reading of, of Article 24 and Article 275. Cardi was mentioned. I'm, I'm not sure to what extent you already discussed Cardi yesterday. It was mentioned um, a couple of times this morning. And I, I presume that everyone, um, some of you will, will know this case very well. I may even be a bit bored by it by now. But, but others um, looking at the, the group's composition also uh, may have heard of it, but, but somehow forgot what it was exactly about. So allow me to, to sort of briefly flag up one or two principles that I think are essential that came from, from Cadi and are still very valid, um, valid today. Cadi, of course, was, um, was is, I mean, the classic sanctions case, right? Um, Cadi was this, um, the, well, the funny thing is he was quite rich, so he may not have suffered too much from his financial sanctions. Um, but on the other hand, in terms of procedure, I mean, this was a very long story. Uh, 
he uh, he had to challenge many many decisions uh, after each other. Um, um, and and still, it's not. He's now been delisted. Um, that's the case. But still, um, it, it's not completely clear still whether he was on the list um, for the correct reasons, for the right reasons. Uh, Kadi has become famous um, in, in EU law um, uh, circles, of course. Um, I even have a, a colleague, Pete Eichhout, in London, who invited him to a, to a conference. Uh, and then, and then Mr. Cardi found out that he was indeed uh, famous, also for for other reasons than he thought of. He, he was be, had become one of the uh, the key figures in EU sanctions uh, law. You may remember, um, the, in this case, from the from the General Court at at, at at the time, that the General Court was faced with this situation. Right, uh, there's a Security Council resolution uh, that we have to follow. Huh? Security Council resolutions are binding not only on the member states, but also on the European Union. And the European Union has um, at several times has confirmed that idea, that it feels bound by those Security Council resolutions. So here the court actually said that, um, well, any, let, let me just read it out here, any review of the internal lawfulness of, contest, of, of the contested regulation, especially having regard to the provisions or general principles of, of community law relating to the protection, protection of fundamental rights would therefore imply that the court is to consider indirectly the lawfulness of those resolutions. So anything that the court would do with assessing the lawfulness of the regulation on the basis of which Cardi um, uh, was, uh, um, uh, in, in, on the basis of which Cardi's sanctions uh, were laid down, um, would imply that the court would have to say something on the lawfulness of the Security Council resolutions. And that is something that the General Court said, I don't want to do, I cannot do. It must therefore be considered that the resolutions of the Security Council at issue fall in principle outside the embed of the court's judicial review. And that the court has no authority to call in question, um, even indirectly, their lawfulness in the light of community law. That is right, of course, right? Let's, let's not, I mean, there was a lot of discussion at the time, but. In principle, this point is, is correct. It would be very strange for, for a regional court to simply say, um, I think that the Security Council resolution um, is invalid uh, and I decide uh, not to follow it. Um, why is that? Why, is, why would that be strange if it would be otherwise? I think one of the best arguments um, was, and, and still is, that if any other state would do this, uh, say, listen, I, I don't think that Security Council resolutions are binding. I think that there's a, they're completely flawed in this case. Um, I decide not to follow them. Uh, that would be that would be the end of the of, of the Security Council uh, and the bindingness of and the acceptance and legitimacy, the bindingness of those uh, of those resolutions. You will remember that the only thing that the court said is the the only possible um, way allowing me to to to. To put into question the Security Council resolution is when it would have been an ultra virus resolution. It would, uh, in, in, it, or it would uh, affect uh, the, the fundamental principles of, 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 of law. Uh, but that is not the case. Um, it's not violating your scogans um, as, as such, the court says. Then, of course, we have the famous case before the, uh, before the court itself. Um, and, and we're still discussing it, even if it is an old case, we're still discussing it in, in, in class every time we have uh, courses on, on, on EU external relations and, and sanctions. So it is an essential case. Um, and, and here the courts um, in, on appeal actually had the chance to, or had to, the challenge actually, to, to find a way out of this, uh, out of this uh, conundrum, if you want. In addition, the court said, according to settled case law, fundamental rights from an integral part of the general principles of law whose observance the court ensures. And there are also international instruments for the protection uh, of human rights on which the member states have collaborated. And let's also mention the European Convention of Human Rights. So there is a whole package of fundamental rights inside the European Union, but also outside uh, to which the European Union and its member states uh, are bound. Um, so let's take a look. What, what does that imply? Um, it implies basically, uh, according to the court, that measures incompatible with respect for human rights are not acceptable in the community. Ah, but now we have a clear conflict, right? Now we have a clear conflict between an international law obligation on the basis of uh, the Security Council resolution and EU fundamental rights. 
there are no strict rules on how to solve that conflict. Um, um, the union wants to be bound, feels, feels bound by international law, but also, obviously, it has to live up to its own fundamental rights uh, obligations. Um, it follows, to paragraph 285, it follows from all those considerations that the obligations imposed by an international agreement cannot have the effect of prejudicing the constitutional principles of the EC Treaty, which include the principle that all community acts must respect fundamental rights. So it cannot be the case that we simply ignore human rights simply because we have to follow sanctions decisions um, of the Security Council. We have to ensure the review, and that is now comes the famous sentence, in principle, the full review of the lawfulness of all community um, acts um, in the light of, the fu of fundamental rights. So what was the, what was the solution that the court came up with? Um, basically, it said, oh, listen, we are bound by those Security Council resolutions. We fully agree with that, um, but we are also bound by those fundamental rights that we um, hold very dear to our hearts in the European Union. And the only way out of is that member states are free in the way in which they implement Security Council resolutions. So the Union would also be free um, to, to find ways to implement uh, and in that implementation of those Security Council resolutions, um, we have to, we have no choice but to follow our own human rights regime, to follow our own human rights rules. That, of course, looked like a very nice, um, well, uh, way out. Uh, but of course, there was a lot of criticism as well. I mean, in implementing um, um, the Security Council resolutions uh, in your own sanctions decisions and your own policies, uh, and of course, by imposing or by, by by giving more weight to fundamental rights than perhaps was the case in the original uh, resolutions, you may, of course, in practice, deviate uh, from the Security Council resolutions um, anyway, right? Um, um, so that is still an open question how to how to actually deal with uh, with that problem. So let me move to to another case which was also briefly mentioned a couple of times this this morning. Um, and I mentioned it here in, in, in the line of C vs P case law um, that has, well, uh, clarified indeed the position of the court in relation to, to sanctions. As I said, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the other cases, again, um, sort of uh, underlining um, what I've called also elsewhere the, the normalization of C vs P that we have seen over the past 10 years. Um, C vs P is no longer the odd one out. Uh, we're still some people still are used to seeing CVSP as the as the second pillar, uh, but even there, even at that time, it was not that different from from the uh, from the other union policies than was sometimes um, sometimes said. Um, Rosneft um, was another step in explaining the court's jurisdiction, and in this case, it was about the question: um, Can national courts actually um, ask preliminary questions to the court? Uh, in relation to CVSP um, decisions, uh, and and the answer again was was yes, um, and many people did not expect this. They said, "Well, this is impossible because uh, the treaty doesn't say anything about the possibility of having um, preliminary questions being asked by by domestic courts to the court in Luxembourg." Uh, so this should be ruled out. Uh, but the court said no. Again, referring to Article 19. Um, um, Let's see, in accordance with the duty assigned to the court under Article 19, it would be contrary to the objectives of the provision and to the principle of effective judicial protection to adopt a strict interpretation of the jurisdiction conferred on the court uh, in Articles 275 and, and 24. So, again, what the court does is looking at Article 19, it's, its primary brief to protect uh, EU citizens uh, and others affected by EU decisions. Uh, and saying this Article 19 for me is the the Bible, if you want. Uh, this is what I look at, I look at uh, irrespective of the fact that in other parts of the treaty um, my jurisdiction may have been phrased um, somewhat differently. Um, so in in, in Rush Neft, um, again, let's let's take a look. Uh, it was about indeed, as we have heard this morning, um, a Russian oil oil company uh, being affected by these sanctions. But in these in this case, right, it was. It entered the court through this um, through this uh, preliminary question. It would be inconsistent, the court said, 
with the system of effective judicial protection established by the treaties to interpret the letter provision, this article 24, 20, 75, 275, as excluding the possibility that the courts and tribunals of member states may refer questions to the court uh, on the validity uh, of council decisions. So it would be inconsistent with the system of effective judicial protection. Um, that is something that we also know from a very early case, Le Ver, where the court already stressed this idea of effective judicial uh, protection. So again, um, very clear answer. Um, yes, um, domestic courts can ask questions to the court on the validity of council decisions, even if they are in the area of CBSP. We have to keep in mind, though, uh, that the question is still open to what extent this can also happen beyond sanctions. I mean, Rosneft was a sanctions case, uh, and on sanctions, we already had this exception in Article 275. Um, so the question remains to what extent this can actually uh, also be extended beyond a sanction situation where domestic courts would actually have the possibility to ask questions to the court to, on other CFSP uh, decisions. Um, Acknowledging, by the way, that there's not so many high. So if you look at the list of CFSP sanctions, uh, sorry, CFSP decisions in general, uh, most of them relate to, to, to sanctions, right? So you, you could even argue that most cases in which individuals would be affected by CFSP decisions would be, would be through sanctions and not through other things, unless indeed you would be working for the European Union um, and, and you would have staff matters to, to, to deal with, for instance. Um, another one, again, I'm sorry, it's always, the, if you're the last speaker, many of the things have already been said, uh, but this one was also mentioned briefly before. Uh, bank, uh, bank Rifa Kagaran, uh, Iranian bank indeed. Uh, and again, uh, that's why I mentioned it here, another step um, in the normalization, uh, if you want, of, of CVSP, jurisdiction of the court. The case was indeed about um, a bank um, that was um, had, had many cases also already. Uh, it started already in 2011, um, and with many ca many cases trying to get off try of these sanctions list, trying to to be delisted, um, challenging these decisions on on which the bank was uh, placed uh, in in these sanctions decisions. Only in the end. Um, the, the, the case that, we're, that we see now here, the very recent case of last month, uh, was not so much about uh, getting delisted. Uh, this was typically about another question. This was indeed about um, the question of non-contractual uh, contractual liability of the European Union. Could the European Union be held liable um, for somebody uh, or an entity um, who was wrongfully uh, listed? Um, do the EU courts have the necessary jurisdiction to determine whether the union can be held non-contractually liable and hear actions for damages uh, against restrictive measures on the basis of CFSP decisions, right? That is the, that was the question. And the court came up with uh, well, was a very interesting uh, was a very interesting case with a very arg interesting argumentation. Uh, but it also was, was interesting to see that it was not even so difficult for the court to answer this, uh, this question. The consistency of the system of judicial protection in EU law requires that in order to avoid a gap for, nat gap for natural and legal persons, the court is competent to rule on damages. It's as easy as that, right? It, it uses the same line of argumentation, the consistency of the system of judicial protection. And that forces the court to, to say something and to, uh, to accept uh, its own rule also to say something on the non-contractual liability um, of the union in situations of CFSP. Um, quite easily, it, it's only a, a, a very small part um, of, the, of the judgment. And we saw something similar also already in the um, Advocate General opinion, uh, Advocate General Hogan's opinion, uh, before this judgment, in which Advocate General Hogan also clearly said, well, almost, I don't see what the problem is. Of course, the court should have jurisdiction here, looking at this system of judicial protection. Um, and that perhaps was even the most striking um, element in all of this, um, the ease with which the, the Advocate General and the court later on actually accepted uh, its, its own jurisdiction uh, in that sense. 
of course, again, huh, um, there was some frowning at the side of the of, of the council um, agents um, during these cases all the time, huh? um, and and perhaps rightfully so, huh? because they they simply point to Article Twenty Four and Article. 275 and say, well, this is what the member states wrote down in the treaty. They excluded the court's role. And what we now see that the court is doing is simply um, using another article in the, in, in the treaty, Article 19, to simply bypass something that perhaps was deliberately um, included uh, by the member states in the treaty. Um, so indeed, um, judicial activism, um, extending its own, uh, own role, um, all of these things we've seen um, in, in, in comments on, uh, on on these cases, but still the case is that that is uh, what we see now is that there's not so much left where the um, where the court cannot say anything about uh, in relation to uh, to CFSP. So indeed, what is, what is the state of affairs? And I see that I'm already most almost at, at the end, um, which is fine. A, a few more minutes. Um, the state of affairs. So at this moment, it is possible for states, non-state entities and individuals to challenge sanctions decisions before the court in Luxembourg. So the direct sanctions uh, are possible. That is nothing new, but it has been confirmed by the court in many, many cases. And the case law has been uh, used to sort of fine tune the criteria. Um, and as we have, have heard in, in the previous presentations, it's not so easy to get off those lists, right? Um, even if the if the um, if the evidence is 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 not that convincing, um, then it's 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 quite quite difficult. Things have have improved, right? Uh, let's let's face it. I mean, in the early days, indeed, there was nothing uh, that could serve as, as any potential evidence. Um, it would simply, in many cases, you would simply follow the uh, the UN, UN sanctions. Um, um, and they, well, let's face it, those sanctions were simply based on confidential CIA um, material. Uh, so in many cases, and that is still the case today, we are not absolutely sure what lies behind uh, those allegations. Um, secondly, it is possible for natural and legal persons to challenge national implementation measures, I should say, of EU sanctions before courts of the EU member states. And these courts may uh, and should perhaps even ask preliminary questions. So indeed, it's not only a possibility for, for those national courts to now engage more actively um, in this, um, in this um, um, situations by asking the court in Luxembourg about clarifications. And um, there's also this obligation indeed, um, I would argue, uh, the moment that they feel that they, if they would not ask a question to the court in Luxembourg, uh, they, they would be forced perhaps to invalidate um, a certain decision, um, then, then of course, this obligation that we know so well, or the photo frost type of, of, of situations, um, would be valid also in CFSP. Um, and thirdly, it is possible for natural and legal persons to ask for a damage compensation before the EU courts. As we heard um, also this morning, the final part is it, it's a, a situation in principle, right? So in principle, this is this is possible. It does not mean that you will get the result that you want. I mean, procedurally, it is possible to now ask for damage compensation um, before the court. The criteria, the threshold to actually be awarded a compensation um, is extremely high. Um, it's, it's almost impossible. And that has to do, and even, even perhaps even more in the case of CVSP than in other situations where you ask the, the union uh, for, for dam damage compensation. Because in CVSP, we're, we're talking about basically a policy decision, right? The decision to impose sanctions, um, the CVSP decision, at least the very first one, um, is a very, let's face it, a very political one. Um, so there's a lot of discussion, shall we do this on, the, on that or not? And that discussion is not only based uh, on, on, on legal arguments. On the contrary, it's, it's largely based on political arguments to impose sanctions. And this sort of policy freedom, of course, um, is in the hands of the, of the union. This is this is what the treaty tells us. Huh? CFSP decision is being taken. Now afterwards, we can have the regulation. But to have this first step, the CFSP decision, uh, implies that you would allow the council uh, to have some policy freedom to do that. And this policy freedom, in turn, makes it very difficult um, then for um, for individuals to actually say that the, the union went beyond what it was uh, supposed to do, and that there is a, a question of, of, of non-contractual uh, liability. 
Um, so finally, then, is, is, is everything solved um, now that we have this line of case law um, over the past years on, on CFSP uh, um, decisions? Um, I, I would say no. <clears throat> um, still, there's, there's a number of, of, of different uh, difficult things to, to, to deal with. Uh, the first of, of that is, is perhaps the, the, the relationship between EU law and international law. Um, Cardi came up with a solution, right? In the implementation of the resolution, we will take care of human rights. But to what extent does that at a certain moment imply that we are no longer able to follow um, United Nations Security Council resolutions? Um, de facto, right? So that is something that we um, have for the moment now solved with, with Cardi, but in practice, of course, it's just a, a sort of artificial, um, artificial solution. Secondly, the decision to impose sanctions is a political one, uh, and the subjects are not heard and often insufficiently informed. Um, um, this was something that was addressed in the previous uh, lecture as well. Um, restrictive measures are often very close to criminal law uh, measures, um, and we've not found a way to, to deal with that uh, in the European Union. Um, just simply saying that these are political or foreign policy um, issues does not do justice to the effect that many of these measures, of course, have uh, on our individuals. And many of you are actually um, defend, uh, well, defending many of those people on the lists uh, before the courts. Uh, we'll have many um, examples of serious situations where you are indeed um, wondering whether the, the measures are not going too far uh, and, the, and the protection for those, the judicial protection uh, is, is, not, uh, is, is, is perhaps not, uh, not enough. Finally, then, uh, the lengthy procedures is, is an issue, right? Um, we've, in many of these cases, we see that the, the victims, if you, or the terrorists, depending on what you want to call them, um, have to return to the court many, many times um, uh, because the decisions are, 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 are changed and adapted uh, each and every time. Sometimes, as we have heard, with a slightly different motivation, which brings you back to square one immediately. Um, and, and that takes many, many, many years. And, and the question is, Again, keeping in mind the fundamental rights in the European Union, to what extent this is acceptable uh, for a union that holds fundamental rights um, closely to its heart. So thanks very much. This is my final commercial uh, uh, announcement. Um, if you want to, to read anything more about EU external relations uh, law in general. Thanks, Ramin. Back to, back to you.